morning and welcome to Governance Dialogues, a program that is hosted by Governance Center. Um, my name is Anissa Cole and I'm the Managing Director of Governance Center, which is a think tank and advisory firm advising um, public, uh, pu public policymakers and companies on uh, priorities related to improving governance um, in this challenging environment. Um, and over the last few months, uh, for, for those of you who have followed Governance Dialogues, we've traveled all over the world from emerging markets such as Saudi Arabia to the Emirates to uh, Europe and Asian jurisdi jurisdictions to talk about governance priorities and how they are shaping up all over the world. And in today's dialogue, I would like to invite you to travel with me uh, to Germany um, and to discuss some of the recent cases that we've unfortunately seen uh, pop up in the financial press regarding the Wirecard scandal, but also um, other uh, corporate governance developments that we've seen in, in Germany in um, recent months. And um, Germany is interesting for, for a number of reasons, of course, one of them being that the German corporate governance style is, is, is traditionally been a quite a particular corporate governance style in the sense that Germany has a dual to your board management and supervisory board. It traditionally has uh, had high uh, participation of employees or relatively high participation of employees and corporate boards, which is um, rare, except for you know, some post-Soviet bloc countries. Um, but also, I think, a quite consensual um, decision style uh, in the management and, and uh, boards of, of large companies. Um, and what we've seen is that this particular corporate governance style has been perhaps difficult to, to make travel to other jurisdictions, to other emerging markets, unlike the Anglo-Saxon model. But it's something that, that's been uh, cherished, I think, by the German, um, the German people and the, 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 corporate, uh, the corporate sphere, uh, most certainly. And yet what we've seen, um, for those of you who have followed the financial press, is, is the, the enormous scandal around Wirecard, which has been uh, declared insolvent, um, and also question marks that were already popping up following the Volkswagen and the Deutsche Bank uh, dilemmas. And to explore these cases in a little bit um, more depth, uh, which I think they merit, uh, I couldn't think of a better person to invite than Christian Stranger, Professor Christian Stranger, who's joining us from uh, Frankfurt today. He's the director of uh, the, Leipzig, um, uh, the Leipzig Graduate School of Management Corporate Governance Center and has had a, an outstanding career in governance, um, having been recognized uh, or awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Corporate Governance Network and having served on management and supervisory boards of a number of German companies and also contributed to the development of the German Corporate Governance Code and efforts by as the institutional investor community to, um, to promote corporate governance. So having seen, I, I think, governance from all sides of the, of the spectrum. So welcome, Christian, to this program and we look forward to, uh, to this dialogue with you. Thank you, Alisa. Uh, happy to be with you on this important uh, topic. Uh, not only the one case, but uh, more general cases and remarks on German corporate governance development. So it, it is really a pleasure to have you. And I, I really think that um, you have a unique perspective on of how, how regulatory, but also corporate developments have evolved in Germany. Um, and my first question is perhaps a little bit obvious, but I can't help but asking about Wirecard specifically. I mean, that is probably the story that has dominated the financial press in Germany, um, I'm guessing for the last few months. And I would like to ask you, when we consider Wirecard from kind of a longer term perspective, do you think it is a watershed moment in German uh, corporate governance, uh, let's say history in, in corporate regulation? Will, will there be consequences uh, in terms of greater regulation, greater oversight, much more so than we've seen, for example, following the Volkswagen uh, story? Is it, is it a watershed uh, moment in, in, in your view? Certainly a pretty unique uh, occurrence. Um, what has happened uh, is what you call in medical terms multiple organ failure because everyone around Wirecard had opportunities to detect the problems um, but uh, in the end uh, nobody uh, uh, really went through and uh, it's uh, the uh, auditors, it's the shareholders, it's uh, uh, the employees, it's the uh, supervisory authorities, it's uh, the politics, they were all 
involved and had their opportunities to perhaps ask more critical questions and uh, research uh, all these uh, allegations that were made uh, since five years. But uh, in the end, they all fell for this wonderful aura of uh, the next SAP in Germany, a great tech company, although the business as such wasn't so complicated. Uh, yeah, it was um, transferring payments uh, to from uh, the purchaser uh, to the final uh, uh, delivery, and that um, sort of uh, was requiring a pretty elaborate platform, but nothing really uh, gigantic in terms of technology. Hmm. And, and from, from a perspective of, of um, sort of investor expectations, obviously, you know, they have been burned. And I'm wondering, you know, when, when you look at these type of fraud cases, you know, more conceptually, do you think that it's fair for investors to have these type of high expectations? Um, you know, in, in the case of banks, for example, you know, we have deposit insurance. Um, but, you know, when you think about corporate fraud, which, I mean, by all um, incidents or by all um, discussions or will be on the rise in the case of um, post-COVID, COVID, well, with difficulties with internal audits and external audits to be carried out virtually. So risks of fraud, I think it's, it's inevitable that we will see more of it, maybe different kind, but more. Um, is, is it reasonable for, for investors to have greater expectations of regulators in terms of um, enforcement? Uh, and what kind of um, assurance can regulators provide today yeah, it's uh, obviously up to the regulators also to set uh, the framework uh, for uh, proper dealing uh, with fraud. Although in this case, the fraud was very elaborate. So one has to feel uh, sympathetic for certain aspects of this whole trickery. Uh, but uh, in the end, in the end, I think uh, too many people overlooked pretty clear signs that something was wrong. And so uh, the regulator, yes, uh, but you have to be clear that regulators are always coming uh, later into the game. Uh, they have their rules and some of the rules were not properly supervised uh, and uh, executed, including uh, that the accounts uh, were not delivered in time uh, this year and there was no uh, breakup uh, of the regulator to say, okay, uh, you uh, will be delisted from uh, the section in the uh, German Stock Exchange, the Deutsche Börse, as a particular section which is called Prime Standard. And you mm -hmm. find there are uh, many names, and that is one of the things that have to be changed. I think the quality requirements for being in the prime standard have to be upgraded substantially. Regulators uh, tried, uh, but too late. And they now say, yeah, uh, we have done uh, a good amount of things. We uh, trusted that the second uh, phase of um, audit uh, challenge uh, uh, would have worked, but uh, they have too few people. But this didn't function because they only had uh, one person to look into uh, this since 15 months. And then it was just too late uh, um, when they sort of came up. So, okay, there will, there will be changes made. Regulators uh, have to adjust, but they're always coming from behind. Uh, investors should uh, rather look towards uh, the uh, auditors and particularly to the supervisory board in the German system. We have this dual system supervisors that control and advise uh, the management board. Of course, but, but I would like to go back to your, to your point, if I may, regarding auditors, because that's been a point of, a, a point of pain, frankly, everywhere, from the UK mm. to the Emirates to, to Germany. Um, and in Germany, um, it's, it's a rare, it's quite a rare system where the, the ministry in charge of the company's law is, is a way, in a way responsible for supervision for corporate governance. Um, and yet auditors are regulated by, as you mentioned, this, this financial reporting enforcement uh, panel. And there's discussion that 
that responsibility should be transferred to BaFin. Is that something that is the right move in your view? I think uh, it makes uh, quite some sense uh, because it's very difficult to have a private organization deal with things that may be uh, uh, fraud like they can only look after whether uh, the accounts have been uh, projected and uh, achieved in the proper in a proper fashion but i think to for them with their small uh, number of people to get behind very intensive efforts uh, for fraud that would be too uh, too much to ask i think the buffin may uh, be also more um, demanding in terms of them uh, if they turn up people uh, would have more fear i would uh, think so because they have ways of getting into the details uh, much uh, sharper and with longer effect mm. are they the the cure for uh, elaborate fraud mm, i'm not too sure um, but uh, i think the lesson uh, that has to be learned is that one should go after suspicious uh, signs, uh, I think, in a much clearer and uh, earlier stage. Sp uh, speedy fashion. Hmm. And, and it's, 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 it's interesting you mention that because indeed some of the investigators we've seen and, and ones that I've been discussing on this program are, are investigations that have taken uh, uh, months and years. But going back to the, to the, to the audit profession, um, I think it's 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 an ongoing dialogue, and, and it's been frankly since since the um, I think the, in a way since the demise of Arthur Anderson. Um, uh, do you think that beyond this particular case in Germany, what we're looking at is a, is a is a is a profession that is currently you know somewhat self-regulated, too concentrated? Is it a viable model going forward? Um, and and should auditors have a greater responsibility in terms of corporate governance if they're especially if they're put under let's say a stronger oversight so for example today you know board of directors uh statements uh, in in financial in, in annual reports are essentially drawn up by you know the board and the, the lawyers and maybe the corporate secretary but there is no let's say stamp of approval or um socks like uh, verification of what the board says um in, in that report is that something that you would uh, welcome? Do you think it would be too much? Uh, or some, uh, uh, perhaps a, a, a stronger check on, on the, the reporting provided by the board where auditors could potentially play a stronger role in, in the corporate governance space? Yeah, I think they uh, uh, should benefit from a stronger separation of audit and advisory business, as you have seen it in the UK, where this is now coming. I think this is also uh, under Portas in uh, Germany and other European countries. Is this a solution for all uh, cures uh, uh, of fraud and similar? Um, I don't think so. Uh, but what we should expect more from auditors is that they don't do just the normal audit work, but the moment that things get a little complex and you could see it in Wirecard accounts, they were having an unqualified opinion for 2018, but there were already quite a few hints in the audit uh, statement, which should have led them uh, to really become much more forensic. And that's, I think, uh, the better solution forward. First, uh, we separate between uh, advisory and pure audit business. And in the audit business, there must be a stronger requirement to get behind things that are perhaps looking uh, vague, uh, where managers uh, uh, always have the habit to explain. And there should be uh, then uh, a need or uh, even a requirement for auditors to become much more forensic, i.e. much more detailed in all these efforts to get behind unclear uh, events. Mm. 
Yeah, it's it's so we we've had actually a similar conversation with another expert um, that I invited on this um, on this program in, uh, from Canada who runs a, a forensic accounting firm who actually um, let's say calls the bluff of companies when they think that their uh, that their accounts mm -hmm. are, are are not up to par. Um, and there are a number of firms that actually, as you know, you know, we also had Carson Block on this on this program and where where who runs a company that short sells. Uh, short sales uh, when, when they see um, when they see irregularities or, or other issues accounting. So it's it's clearly something that um, um, others are, are are looking at um, both from a you know, from a business model point of view as well. Um, I would like to perhaps um, talk about um, a slightly different um, a topic. If I may switch gears a little bit um, in the kind of looking at developments in Germany. There are two um, potential cases where you see also not only sort of private shareholders raise uh, questions, but also interference from, from the government, you know, with uh, Angela Merkel's interference and in the Wirecard story in some regards that have raised questions. But also if we look at um, more recently, I commented in an article, uh, the Lufthansa case where the, the major private shareholder had quite mm -hmm. concerns about being diluted from, by the government in this latest rescue operation of Lufthansa. What is your view on these developments specifically and more generally? Is, is, is the, the line between state and private interests in the world post-COVID COVID getting increasingly blurred? And what are the, the concerns that you might have in that regard? Well, quite clearly, I think the COVID uh, uh, situation has been uh, mostly responsible for the government now taking uh, a role in companies. Um, it's been uh, pretty uh, well debated whether this is a welcome uh, development. In the case of Lufthansa, there was quite some battle between a large private investor who came late and said, I want to continue to fly first class and uh, the likelihood that if the government gets involved uh, yeah, that there would be business class only uh, is increasing. So in the case of Lufthansa, it's a question of survival and they got 9 billion. Uh, we've got the uh, biggest travel operator in the uh, world, TUI, that has so far gotten 3 billion uh, euros, which also, they have gotten this money without equity stake. The government, in the case of Lufthansa, insisted on a larger equity stake, which had to be sanctioned by the shareholders who had no real choice because it was a question of survival. In the case of TUI, they got the second helping, so to say, and now the government has said they want to also see a higher equity stake where they can participate. I think as long as this remains COVID related, uh, yeah, then fine. Uh, but generally, I think at least most people in Berlin say um, governments uh, are not the better operators of private companies. So in the end, although we have experience with Telekom, uh, Deutsche Post uh, and other uh, bigger companies, it's something uh, that isn't sort of doing too well. You mentioned Volkswagen, where the state of Lower Saxony uh, plays a very uh, intensive role, which is uh, not uh, very helpful from the investor's point of view, because uh, they allow um, all the ones who did uh, uh, the diesel matters to get away with very little. Um, uh, the other day, there was 9 million uh, paid uh, by uh, the uh, chairman and the uh, chief executive, but that was paid from the company's coffers, uh, i.e. it's always the investors. And guess who got the money? Uh, the state of Lower Saxony uh, and uh, their prime minister happens to be the deputy chairman of Volkswagen. So. Uh, uh, there are unpleasant cases uh, uh, which give uh, also the politicians um, the idea that uh, public engagement or engagement by the state uh, is something that is uh, only the second emergency option. 
Mm. Well, I think that, you know, we've been writing a lot about this um, kind of the state capitalism, let's say more generally, even before COVID, but also the injections, um, mm -hmm. uh, equity injections by governments all over, all over the world. And uh, in particular, for those of you who might be interested in the airline sector, I have an op-ed coming up um, looking at airlines. And I, I personally predict consolidation, enormous consolidation in the sector, in my view, along the line of sort of what we've seen in the stock exchange industry. But of course, um, time will mm -hmm. tell and what governance that would bring with it. But what I would like to pick from, from your from discussion and, and, and your observations and what is happening in Germany is that there is sort of, um, I guess from what you're saying, more and more questions being asked and perhaps even more for the first time, as far as I know, in, in kind of German corporate governance history, shareholders willing to really take um, measures. So, for example, in the, in the Bauer case, uh, shareholders voted against the, the head of the management board, I think in the first ever history in, uh, case of that nature in, in the country. Um, it, it's something that we've seen, of course, in, in Anglo-Saxon, let's say, jurisdictions mm -hmm. and, you know, greater, where greater participation of uh, proxy advisors and uh, mm -hmm. various advisors to the to institutional investors have kind of facilitated this more active um, mm -hmm. shareholder capitalism. But it's not something that we've seen, I think, historically in, in Germany. Do you think that it's sort of, it's, um, we're, we're just getting a first taste of what's more to come in that regard, or is, are these sort of, you know, two or three isolated cases that, that have occurred, unfortunately, within, you know, a relatively sort of like short yeah. time period? Well, I think it will increase because uh, German uh, companies are much more in demand over the last 10 years by international investors. Mm. And of the DAX 30 companies, uh, they own about 60%, i.e., uh, given that they are generally uh, willing to go along, otherwise they wouldn't invest. Uh, but nevertheless, they, they have their proxy advisors uh, to help them uh, find out uh, situations which are very special. And you talk to the one uh, who organized in some ways uh, the Bayer, uh, um, so Bayer event where the chief executive did not get the discharge, which was a first. And so I think there will be more of that. It will become more normal um, for international investors, but also German investors to uh, um, pursue their own interests, which they have to do uh, because the role most asset managers is a fiduciary one. And uh, in the Europe, we just had uh, the additional effort uh, by the European Commission and the European uh, Directive um, that uh, says, okay, you investors, you big investors have a role to play. And if you don't, then you're missing uh, a key point of your obligations. Of course. And, and on that last um, point, if I may ask, um, because it, it is something that's quite, um, as I said, you know, it's, it's a sort of a relatively new development in, in, in the German corporate governance sphere. I wonder what your thoughts are as sort of as a concluding question in terms of um, convergence in the governance world. Do you, do you believe that we're basically witnessing this sort of more active shareholder capitalism worldwide? Is, is, is that a prelude to, um, to a convergence of, of um, let's say, capitalist models uh, or governance models worldwide from Germany to Scandinavia to, you know, Anglo-Saxon inspired uh, type uh, models, which have traditionally been, let's face it, quite different. Is, is that a prelude to a greater kind of flow in the same direction? Or do you think there will still be, um, you know, apart from legal differences, like the, the type of um, uh, mm -hmm. the board structure, there will still be uh, significant differences between your model and, you know, let's say the UK, the US uh, and other. Yeah, um, I don't think we have too much of a difference uh, today because no. uh, you see even in the Anglo-American model, the non-executives are playing uh, their role in the committees. Yeah. And in some ways, they are supervisors when they are acting in the committees as independent non-executives. So 
uh, I think there the systems are growing together. And uh, what is also obviously a very important development is the uh, growing um, effect of stakeholders who say we want to have uh, much more of a say. There's even uh, some effort uh, in the UK, uh, which was uh, denied in the end, but also in the United States, that uh, the co-determination uh, that we have in Germany, which investors um, say, okay, that's the German uh, situation, that some uh, representation of employees may be uh, unavoidable, and uh, we have pretty good experience whether we need uh, full um, participation uh, in terms of 50-50, uh, I doubt, but uh, giving stakeholders a say through the employees who, if they work in uh, the uh, firm, uh, then I think companies can benefit from that. Mm -hmm. There's a nice saying, to Felix Austria, and the Austrian model is uh, quite uh, convincing uh, because the uh, employee representation is limited to one third, must be working in the firm, they're not unionized people, and they don't get extra pay. So um, they uh, have the uh, situation uh, much clearer uh, that uh, they are working also on behalf of the shareholders. So there's plenty of new things. There's a, a heavy debate in the United States uh, after the um, CBI said, uh, yeah, we are now looking at stakeholders uh, uh, much more. We aren't so sure here whether it is um, already seriously on the way. And there's a fine debate between the academia particularly uh, uh, Professor Bebchok in Harvard uh, yes. says uh, stakeholderism is on, uh, on the way, but he thinks it's not uh, the ideal solution either. So uh, fine debate, uh, more to come, and hopefully uh, to the benefit uh, of the companies and the investors. Uh, we'll, we'll work on that. Yes, thank you, Christian. And actually, um, we, we've had a number of conversations, um, notably we were hosted uh, previously Colin Mayer, and obviously uh, quite in touch with uh, Lucian and on his work, uh, which I think is very interesting in terms of their empirical work on what, uh, mm. what companies actually do when they say they adopt uh, different stakeholder models. Um, and so some of this research, uh, for those of you who are, for the audiences that are really interested in kind of a deeper dive in governance, those are, those are um, kind of seminal pieces I, I, would, I would invite you to, to look at, but um, for the purposes of today's uh, conversation, which I, I promise to keep to uh, about one, one half an hour format, I really would like to thank you for sharing your thoughts on developments in Germany, but also more generally kind of where the global, um, the global governance debates and global capitalism is going. Uh, in these um, uh, strange and challenging times. So uh, thank you for, for joining us and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have the honor to have you again on this program. Okay, great pleasure. Thank you, Alisa, and good luck. Yeah.